G'day guys. So we're back for number eight. We've traded Ferg. How you going, Ferg? Yeah, good thanks. Good to be back on. Yeah. How's Bali treating you, mate? Must be coming into some good weather at the moment. Now it's what is it? What are we in June? Yeah, almost July peak season for tourists. Yeah, that's no, it's getting busy. Yeah, no, certainly we've got um it's crazy around here because they with um the elections they both made a whole lot of promises and one of them was to put in footpaths everywhere so they're actually doing it but it's just like chaos with um digging up both sides of the road diggers everywhere um trucks everywhere it's actually really fun with my son because he just like screams at the top of his lungs like digger or truck so it's just like constantly driving down the road just like pointing at diggers and trucks um but yeah kind of barley it's all so haphazard like there's just no no health and safety. Like the digger just like swings across the road with a bucket. Like, <laughs> just, <laughs> I can imagine. It's loose. Yeah. <laughs> I can't even imagine think, a footpath going in. Like that just does my head in. Like especially Batu Belong or where you pen, pen type for in. Well, was that main yeah. street from the beach in Frenin? I can't imagine a footpath going in. You barely get a scooter. It's both sides. They, they they literally didn't give a shit about what anyone had out the front. They just like fucking, they just turned up with a um like the digger with the, the jackhammer on the front and just destroy whatever they need to make it work. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. impressive. Like some people would just build cafe fronts and stuff and they just tear it down. They just I think so. show their little certificate from the government. Yeah. There's, there's big... one poor dude that's yeah. got like a garage that needed the gradient. And now that the footpath's there, he, he, he doesn't have the gradient. So his driveway is like, <laughs> <laughs> cool. like joke, you edit. Yeah, he'll have to buy like a, a really high wheelbase, like four wheel drive to get into his garage. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. I love that when these um when the government just comes in in Indonesia or Bali and like nothing matters and you get all these tourists and gringo oh not gringos, tourists just like cruising around and like they're doing their like finding themselves in the rice field and they're all about nature and a bit hippie and then they just see like excavators just like burn past start rock breaking right next to cracks me up. Destroying anything yeah. in its path, uh, Indonesia. Yeah, There's a lot of that at the moment. There's just development everywhere. Yeah, it's like feels like there's definitely going to be a situation of overbuilding here, oversupply. Yeah. yeah, just keeps moving further along. I imagine what's what's Sessa like these days? Is that getting quite crowded? The cafes and stuff going in there. Yeah, so they're building a big beach oh. beach club slash hotel there. So there's just. Right. Truck after truck going in there. It's really sad, actually. Yeah, they um, like sleepy little village. Like for anyone trying to picture this, it was like sleepy little village with like chickens, a few cafe, like real like basic, almost shacks, like cafes on the beach. And now, um, now they're putting like a massive beach club in, and kind of the whole area is just trying to keep up with that development. So it's just it's just construction now, which is sad. Yeah, remember when we first met and like we were in Changu and I swear there wasn't even much going on in Perenan at that time as well. Yeah. Batu Belong was like the extent of like the densely populated villas and like it was kind of like past there it kind of got a bit um it it remained quite local and rice paddies and and yeah just quite untouched and now yeah just thinking back what's that seven eight years ago but yeah it just moves so quick along there I can imagine that whole um yeah, that whole area just developing, but the surf drops off, I imagine, from Echo pretty much, and then it gets pretty shitty further along yeah. west you go. So that probably might limit it a little bit, I'm thinking. Maybe. I'm hoping. Yeah, we're, we're like deciding where we want to go after this place. Like we're going to go up the coast again. Like the real big debate is like how far to go if we are going to like buy something for a, like a more freehold long term place so like yeah is it is 10 minutes enough should we be looking more like 20 minutes up the coast yeah what will happen with hugo schooling like how much is making him travel too much is yeah so go to all those debates yeah well oh, of course you got to talk about that so you, so you're just mm. you're still long-term bali as far as you can foresee for now that's still the plan yeah like we, we discuss it every year on the year but i don't see us going anywhere with um the Mia's business keeps expanding, so she's um, got a new, new like factory slash in a sort of studio. So she's hiring. She's a she's a fashion designer, right? She's got a really popular yeah. 
really popular brand. What's it called? More Mia or something? Uh, more Mia. Yeah. Yeah, more Mia. So it's lots of um, kind of like like jumpsuits and um, cocktails and dresses. Um, that sort of stuff she kind of goes after more like the sort of the low point of like the high end fashion market. Mm. And um, yeah, kind of has it all, all the production here and exports it mainly to US and um, London, Paris. Like she's kind of targeting those markets more. Um, she's got a little. A few shops now around Bali, so that's um, she's starting with that as well. But yeah, she just keeps expanding. I think she's hiring another like three people this week, so it just keeps building out her team. So right. yeah, that's gonna by default keep us here longer. We've also got nanny nannies and house cleaners is pretty damn good. So don't don't know if we could give that up anytime soon. But um, over the long term, probably probably end up spending more time maybe on the coast of Montenegro or something. Wouldn't be wouldn't be bad but that'll be just kind of a split between here and bali yeah yeah i always say to people that it's pretty hard to beat bali even even when you look at central america and like other places that could be quite similar outside of asia mm. well, central america is really it um it just doesn't compare in my my books bali is just so much better even thailand like, thailand's just beautiful um but yeah bali I, I think what happens is a lot of the North Americans, Canadians, they first port a call outside of North America or is, is Central America. And then they just get there. They see palm trees, yeah. they see cheap prices, they see a bit more lifestyle freedom. And they're just like, whoa, this is it. I'm going nowhere. And start talking it up and thinking it's heaven on earth. But yeah, making the trip over to Bali, I think it will um, change their view. And yeah, yeah I, I just don't think you can beat Bali in Indonesia in general. I love it. Well, I just... Yeah, it's such a unique setup here in the fact that um starters the Balinese are just lovely. Like they they're far more welcoming than all the surrounding islands. So that definitely had an effect. And then you had like the a lot of the Aussies that came here with money really like really affected like the whole cafe culture and like it's you get I haven't experienced anything else around the world like it, like how it's like a real like Darwinian set up here where unless you have good food, good coffee, like you're not going to survive. There's that many ca- cafes and restaurants opening that like the level's just really high. And so there's just so much quality. So we're just spoiled. And then, yeah, just the whole infrastructure, like like Mia loves horse riding. There's like multiple great equestrian centers. I love BJJ. I've got like two really high-end gyms within, um, within sort of 10, 15-minute drive of me. Um, yeah, see good restaurants, good food. Um, living in the tropics, got the whole. You still got all the the benefits of um, kind of like, uh, like workers for Mia's business, and obviously nannies and um, house cleaners and stuff. Yeah, so no, it's it's. I don't think we can match it anywhere in the world at the moment. It's um yeah, when you lay it out like that, it's insane. I actually am not a huge fan of the tropics these days. I don't know what's changed in me, but I used to spend all my money going <laughs> on the tropics, especially coming from Tasmania. You're similar mm-hmm. from New Zealand. I just, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know what happens to my body there, but I just get too weathered. Like, I don't recover. Yeah. Just, I'm like spending half a day in air con. Like, I don't know how I used just to a, do You're just a big horse. <laughs> <laughs> big. Oh, it's so funny. It's so true, though. I just, I just struggle with humidity and my body just freaks out. It's like, what the fuck are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. Um, yeah, but all, yeah, when you lay it out like you just did, for Bali's bloody unbeatable. It's so good. Except for the traffic. Traffic's horrendous. Is it still that bad? Yeah, I imagine. It's worse. It's worse. It's like, it's, um, yeah, we're like discussing. Like the, this is like where we're going with like our thought process for, like if, Kind of most. I, I was joking the other day that the, um, like the, often vehicles are how you display status in a lot of places in the world. And here, there's like some real dickheads um, have come here that have made obviously a decent amount of money. There's, there's like a Lamborghini Adventor like drove past us in a cafe the other day here, and it's an absolute joke because you can't get the thing out of like second gear here. Like it's all just constant traffic and scooters and so. He's just like grinding the clutch on the thing, like rolling along. So what what is actually luxury here is I'm getting like like they've got like high end vans that are like proper like fitted out interiors with like like reclining um like lounge chairs in them and a like a big screen TV. <laughs> so that 
that's like yeah that's probably like the next step in the future if we like have to do more um you go further out and you got to like travel down to the airport or um stuff like that is get something what? like that that you can just yeah just accept it's going to be shit and going to be a while but <laughs> flick on a movie <laughs> <laughs> yeah just adapt to it <laughs> can't imagine seeing that rolling past in Bali. Just be like, fucking hell. Sounds like a completely different place from um, from when I was there. Jeez, I can't even imagine what it's like, especially driving around Changu. I just imagine gee, just rapid development, tourists from everywhere, Russians everywhere, just, yeah, yeah. hectic. Yep, no, you're not, not too far off. That's pretty much what's happening. Yeah, just just exploding. Yeah, I just wonder how sustainable it is. But then again, it's like, kind of like the Aussie housing market every time it's sort of like it isn't isn't sustainable it seems just to grow higher and more people build so yeah time time will tell but to me it feels like it's kind of a um a lot of the money here is like kind of almost a um it's people doing well and bringing money here from other areas not that many people are making money here so when that dries up if we have a big sort of downturn it will like you really felt here. Um, but yeah, as for now, it's just everyone going crazy and building and building. Yeah. No, I imagine so. Oh, mate, what are you working on at the moment? You've been pretty busy. You did an epic podcast on Money of Mine podcast, which is a favorite of mine. I've been watching them since I started. And yeah, I, yeah. I was actually a bit surprised I hadn't got you on early earlier because i know a lot of the stuff they talk about is like a lot of the stuff you've talked about for years so um hmm. yeah that was a great one mate <laughs> cheers yeah i love those guys um i was got in touch with trav first and was just like um chatting away with him on whatsapp and then had a chat with him um yeah they're just lovely guys and that, that was such an easy chat for me because every now and then you just get yeah guys that are like, like kind of interested in the same stuff and so they were interested in the stuff I'm interested in. And I'm like, yeah, I can talk about any of this stuff all day. I love it. I'm always trying to work out more of it. So no, that, yeah, that, that was really fun. Um, I like how you, I love, what, love what they're doing. I liked how you got on there and kind of, kind of made the, they get a lot of these specialists on like in lithium or like a commodity that just focus their whole business around the one commodity. And then they, they, mm. they push them on it. And then these guys are always just like defending that commodity with whatever, um, whatever they can really, because they know their whole business relies on it. And it's kind of good to just have like step back and have your view on it all and just be like, you know, this is where it's likely going. Like, I don't know, just have a more generalized view rather than like just a strictly business orientated view all the time. But yeah, that was my take anyway. I, I, I find that really, yeah, not, not enough people want to actually discuss that, like the overall big idea. Like I, I found... Like I read a piece by the Koala, like um, they, they had him on the Koala as well. Like obviously a super smart guy. He's like 10 times smarter than me. But the thing that I find interesting is when he like, like he like makes the analogy that like lithium's like the new iron ore. You're going to experience like a massive boom. I'm like, like, can we just talk about that one assumption? Like right at the start before he like goes into all his maths and going, finding the perfect mind and stuff. And I just, yeah, I was like, I just, I think that's wrong to start with. Mm. And especially if you, um, like there, there isn't any pressure on that when you've got lots of competing technologies. Like if the sodium ions really taking off, that kind of puts a lid on how much price appreciation you can have in lithium. And then if there is this big pipeline of projects and you've got substitutability, it's just not where you want to be in a commodity. You want to be in a commodity where mm. there is no ability to substitute. You've got kind of, um, price and sensitive buyers that are forced to buy it. Like uranium is a perfect example. They can't, a, a reactor can't just swap out uranium for thorium. A yeah. reactor can't um, like just run as nuclear reactor on coal. Like there, there is no substitute, um, substitution. And then there's also no demand destruction. Like, a, like I fully like embrace the idea that at some point with a lot of commodities, like you can't have certain past a certain price it, they will, it'll just be swapped out like at a certain price of um, gas, you'll see substitution for coal. Like it, it just, um, economics works that way. So when you find the sector where it can't really be, and that's what a lot of my work's been is trying to like really pinpoint 
those like uranium is a great example. Tin's an interesting example. Um, like it's really hard just to substitute out tin because it's such a small percentage and so important in its properties. Um, what about copper? Yeah, I've, I've battled with. I've battled with getting my head around that, knowing what I know from what I learned off you. So, like you said, I think we talked about it last time, but it's a bit more versatile. It has a bit more, you know, use than just batteries like lithium. So, it it goes through the whole economy, like wiring. It's it's not just subjected to the the green ESG narrative, right? Yeah, the problem with copper is like, who doesn't know that? Like, what you've just explained is like so well um, understood that it. Like everyone's aware of it, and everyone's um, trying to rectify that. Like I, I understand. Like you can run through a supply demand, and it's still really strong, and there's a good story, and it'll do well. But I think it was Koala that, like, just illustrated when he was looking at the um, some of the recent deals. Um, investors are willing to pay like three times um, more for a um, dollar of cash flow from copper than they are from Met, Met Coal, and it's. Like you're paying, you're paying a lot for that certainty. And so while the supply demand might be really good and I don't disagree with it at all, um, when you pay up, you inherently kind of, um, you lower your um, margin of safety and, and to an extent you lower your asymmetry because you just pay more. And by everyone realising the fact, they're doing their best to kind of correct it. And so... The, the simple way of explaining that is because the copper story is so, um, so easy to understand and has a good fundamental case, all the majors are chasing it. And by default, the supply demand in the future will look a lot better than something like coal where everyone's dumping it and trying to divest of it and doing their best to get it off their books and, and cut it off from capital. Like when you read a lot of the majors, they're just trying to run down their coal um, assets. They're just like literally going out of their way to like high grade them and get them off their books. That's not, um, that's just going to make the situation worse in the future. And so that's where I want to be, where the situation is going to get worse, not better. But with, with copper, if I'm understanding right, if you have these majors moving in and willing to pay whatever to get the asset, that's quite attractive for some of these mid tier junior companies that are sitting on sitting on these assets, right, for a potential, like, much more likely for a potential yeah. over or something. Yeah, like yeah, so, certainly. Like, depends what game you're playing. If you're playing, like, the um, hoping for M&A, then, yeah, yeah sure. But that um, goes without saying. If you're playing that, I'm, what I'm talking about is where the commodity will ultimately have to trade to incentivize supply yep. um, on, a long, on a longer time, longer time frame. That's that's a very interesting question because I, you see a few um, price targets or prediction that what what will be the spot price to incentivize um, new mines and I think Goldman put it at copper fifteen thousand dollars a ton or something and like we're way off mm. that mark and that mm. opens up all the a lot of the porphyries in South America and the big behemoths that are just sitting there really low grade and need billions in capex. But yeah, like it basically has to get to that point before, um, yeah, we see any any further work, I guess, on some of those some of those stocks that are just sort of. I'm talking, I'm focusing on Argentina here because they've just got a ton of these just sitting there waiting to waiting for that price incentive to um, to come. But yeah, it's it's like what's going to get it there, and then that's the, that's the thing. What's yeah. what's going to be the, the point to get it there? Like, is it just going to be supply demand fundamental story, or is it going to be a catalyst? But yeah, it's, such well, a big... it's, it, it's also the fact that even if you know where the commodity is going, is there like a clean way to play it? Like I had this chat with um, Paulo Macro, like we were going back and forth on WhatsApp at the start of the year, and he was like super bullish copper then. Mm. And I kind of like agreed with his take, but I just couldn't find a good way to express it. Like I was looking at, um, at bull calls on some of the majors, and they're all really expensive. Um, I look, like, looked at some of the copper juniors. I was like, oh, I don't really want to like take decent positions in any of these guys. Um, like it, it's hard. Like a, a lot of the really smart guys as well. They're all talking about like um, they're all getting into futures, and I, I don't, 
I just don't want to do that sort of high leverage future game. That's not me. Um, and I honestly think the vast majority of retail will just screw themselves up by jumping in futures. It's tough. Um, it's really tough um, dealing with that much leverage and having things go against you. And the, the commodity game in itself is just super volatile. So um, I think you're asking for trouble when you suggest people go into um, the futures game. And then we are lucky enough to have like a liquid options market. It's still surprisingly hard to get like cheap volatility. And then, and then you've got to be right in the time frame. Like I've, I've had this with um, like the oil, oil futures probably been one of my worst, worst trades um, by the time it's all done for how much I've, um, I will have burned in the, op- not, not, so much the amount I would have lost on it, but the opportunity cost on the stuff that I was putting on at the same time. And I always try and do that analysis. Like I say, I put a, at the time I was putting on some of the oil trades, I might've been buying some like MMA offshore. Like that's a, that's a painful reality when one, um, one like kind of burn the premium and the other goes seven, eight X like that. Just, yeah, that hurts. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still trying to, battle with how I play, yeah, resources in Argentina. And I don't like lithium, so I don't like anything in Salta in the north of the provinces there that a lot of ASX-listed companies are um, are up there with projects. And I just did an article on uranium, and I just, there's not many players here, so I just thought, um, like, you, like you said, it's probably just a, a call option, some of those stocks to the uranium price, like an out-of-the-money call option. So... Um, yeah, I d- dug into a couple of those companies as I'm starting to get used to Canadian stocks, which is a whole different ball game to to Australia with warrants and how they list and their their um, private placements. Um, so yeah, this is so that's why I've come to copper and I yeah just look at Argentina not producing any, then I look at over the mountain range in Chile producing the most in the world, and then second is Peru, and I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense to me at all. Um, what's going on here? And then you look into it, it's the economic situation, basically. And they are quite on the lowish grade end of um, of copper deposits. But still, it's just, yeah. And now we've had a change in in um, in that economic, economic environment with Malay coming in, making um, foreign investment a lot easier here with his new Ridgey. And yeah, so that's that's the opportunity I can sort of see for myself while I'm here with a little bit of an advantage to yeah, meet up and talk to some of these guys. I, I think, yeah, I think you're in a great place for it. And it's also to understand that you can come up with a really good thesis and you don't need to put it into play immediately. I think that's been one of my bigger lessons over the years now is like there can be something that's like a really airtight thesis. It's just not its time yet. Like um, I wish I'd done this more was like kind of understand this this is a real prime setup, but I'll just um, put it on the shelf until I see a few more signs to kind of get on board. And yeah. you, you really do need to do that with miners, otherwise you just get cleaned up. Like it's um, kind of like it's one of the things, like I think, I think Cappy wrote a piece a while ago, like saying like breakouts were like um, silly, like why wait till um, something's broken out and got more expensive to buy it. Well, I like disagree with that when you come to like certain things that are just like it really de risks it to show that there's like momentum because I do a lot of buying breakouts and like offshore mm. and a lot of the stuff's been like bottom crawling for for years and years formed a really strong base and there's there's a lot of signal when it breaks out and inflecting and you look below the surface and you see like um like the start of making money again like the debt's under control um the share counts um. That's your stop going that's up. your that's yeah. your tactic, isn't it? That's like your your main thing is um that, yeah, well, it was, <laughs> eh? that in a nutshell. Yeah. Besides besides uranium, I think it's a different case because obviously them for them to make money is a long way down the track. But yeah, it was it was it was realizing that, and a lot of that was just looking back over and it was like what stuff actually worked and why did it work at that particular time? And some of it's just pretty obvious, really. Like just looking at like MMA offshore, like it. It really started inflicting when they started making money, and then um, yeah, it's like it's not that hard. Like people, sure, you can get a little bit cheaper front running it, which is kind of what I've tried to do with some names. But then again, I've been pretty heavily punched in the face when I've done that. Like thought, like Transocean was cheap, but obviously the 
the earnings side look horrible. Same with Dolphin. And both of them have punched me pretty heavily in the face, which is like a probably an example that I should just keep to the the basic sort of breakout and earnings inflecting at the same time. Like those those lining up um, give give a pretty big green light that you um, you're not going to have to suffer much of a drawdown and um, you're going to have a reasonably smooth ride, which um, which is always nice in this game. Yeah, bloody hell. Last, I think it's been about a month since um, I was in Peru and I remember I was, everything was great. Like portfolio is up now, but if you look at it now, how I'm going, I reckon I've given back a couple hundred thousand in the last month. It's, it's been brutal, especially on uranium. Um, what are your thoughts around uranium? I want to talk about Paladin as well, mate. What do you think about this deal they've got with uh, Fission? Yeah, yeah, just starting with like the volatility at the moment. Yeah, it's painful. Yeah, I've got feel like I've been, yeah, <laughs> just to a few hundred thousand. I think I'm <laughs> some seven figure, yeah, drawdown at the moment. So, yeah, it's it's not not fun, it never is, but I honestly don't mind because it's not there's um, there's one thing if you've made like a fuck up and you're getting punished, and one company and the sectors grinding that hurts but i never mind as much when the whole sector's taking a mm-hmm. smack um like if you look across a lot of the names they're, they're all down that sort of 20 30 percent um and it's all i think everyone's just too glued to to spot um and it's just a super thin market um it's not where uranium's really trading and where it's going to trade moving forward not the supply side isn't getting fixed um demand keeps grinding higher the setup's getting better um i just i just think this is some volatility the weather and the future's going to be bright doesn't make me less painful and as i was observing with a few um members yesterday i was like there's similar sentiment across um across all the energy like I've got certain subsets within my subscriber base that are like really heavy coal. Some are really heavy offshore. Some are really heavy oil. And everyone's just like, "Fuck this shit! <laughs> this is so hard." Oh, this is, yeah. No, no like, I, it, I still struggle with it. Bit. I'm the worst for this, and I, I'm lucky I've got you to talk to about it because I <laughs> beat myself up hmm. still. But it's it's brutal, man. Like I, as a result of this as well, I haven't been able to write on my um, UEC position. So I haven't been able to write any, any mm. income. I had a great, I reckon it's a great one for me, six months of just writing con- quite consistently on uranium and having like a nice monthly income stream. And yeah, this, mm. in one month, it's just been absolutely brutal. <laughs> so that's how, that's how that game actually works, which no one ever wants to talk about. Everyone like, just oh. like wants to talk about the good months and project it, yeah. This is, this is um, what I struggle with. Sorry to cut you off, but this is where I struggle with. Um, mm-hmm. On my sub stack, I'm obviously trying to promote writing some covered calls when the condition's are right, but I've, I've always got, and I know you do on yours too, you always put, you know, this can be very inconsistent. There's going to be periods where you can't write. Um, and then I guess what sometimes people sign up because they expect just like a constant stream of income. They think I'm day trading and like constantly hitting goals. And I'm just like, no, no, like you that's completely not right. You got to, it's got to complement your long-term thesis with, you know, whatever sector you have a strong conviction in. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's tough, but that's, yeah, it's, I, I think I like wrote a quote. I was like, what was it? I, I wrote it the other day. It was, um, yeah, it was like, never forget this game is hard. If you find it easy, you're probably about to be reminded it's hard. <laughs> it's just, it's just, that this game, it's yeah, you earn your returns, and and it's it's past like the energy trade as well. Like no no one's having fun if unless you own Nvidia, like yeah, like you look at, across the broad market, everyone's underperforming. Um, whatever you own, unless you own like a bit of the Mag Seven and had a heavy weight into Nvidia, like e- everything else everywhere is pretty much having a hard time. Like there's, um, and if if you're doing okay, like you're just doing average like this um it's it's all kind of like the other the other side of that trade and at the moment nvidia is just um it's just like a i think cuppy had it like a like a whirlpool and it's just sucking in all the capital from everywhere else just going crazy it's nuts isn't it uh, didn't it just dump, didn't it just mm. dump like 40 percent in the last couple of days or 
something, something stupid. I think I'm uh, 15. Yeah. Oh, 15. It's, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think it will get I think it will get there over the longer term. It'll do forty, fifty at least. It's um, yeah, the numbers just don't work when you. And it's interesting how much everyone has their head in the sand. When I've actually got like a, um, I'm going to show it here. I think I think about the chart. Um, let me dig this up because this is quite interesting. Um, yeah, so it's just this. Uh, can I? Can you enable me to share a screen on that? Where do I do that? No, it's disabled by, oh, by default. Oh. I think. Hang on. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. That work? Yeah, yeah, that works. So it's just this. Um, can you see that? Can you can yeah, you yeah. see that screen? Yep. Yeah. So this is just Cisco, which is um. I'm going to use this as an example before that, that like multiples are just like enthusiasm. Like I, I always say that, like if you look up, there's always like a, a like, there's like a definition for it. It's like the, how, um, how sure you are of the earnings moving forward warrants a higher multiple. And there's like, there's like a famous, um, there's like a famous quote from Scott McNeely back in the dot com boom that, um, like how, crazy like price to sales of like tenors and um and yeah you see that like there was a, a point at which um the market for what well, for um for price to earnings that thought that cisco deserved like nearly 150 times they thought that they deserved nearly 40 times and then um and then from then on the market just decided from like that point forward regardless of all the boom we've seen lately it was like just 13 times PEs about right um, for Cisco Systems when it became rational. It decided like three and a half times um, price to sales is about right after hitting 40 times. And this is just, and even though they grew, like everything they promised in the dot com, they actually, they actually really delivered on. Like they grew earnings um, double digits for like decades. Like look at, look at that. Yeah, look at that. And then, the, yeah, they really like the backbone. Cheers. And then they yeah, and so 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 yeah, where I'm going with all of this is just um yeah, we we just let me stop. Do I stop sharing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yep, yep. Back in, yeah. It's um, it's just like yeah, humans are silly, and we um we get overexcited. We um we raise multiples to to levels the um the company can't ever grow into. Um, with um, Nvidia, it's quite interesting that they they actually had to cut prices in China because they can't compete with the the, the local domestic oh, manufacturers, and and by default that means that they can't compete across the developing world if they're going to have to compete with China. And then you you take that back to what their um, projected growth rate is going to be. Um, <laughs> just yeah, it's, it's, it's not hard to. Um, so just a repeat of, and, of Cisco or something like that, that pattern. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's that's the way I see it playing out over a long enough time frame. Um, but yeah, back to what was um, what were we talking about? Oh, Paladin. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, of, that's the deal. Yeah. So I was kind of. It's interesting. I understand it. Like I'm like kind of. Sh- I don't love it, but I don't hate it either because it, it does make sense when you know that they've got kind of a limited um, sort of mine life. They've already contracted, um, like half their books contracted, and then they've got, um, whereas they say they've got, whatever is it, 17 years of mine life, um, some of that's at like a higher rate, and then it um, and then it dips down after, I think it was after 10 years, I think, was it like six, mm. six million of which they've got their own, um, was it seventy five percent? And then yeah, it dip, yeah, like a high reckon. Then it dips down to it's three mil after the ten year mark. So even that 70, 17 year line mine life isn't isn't as um, great as it's sort of made out. And then with their three asset uh, sort of exploration assets, they've got obviously the Australian ones are um, are blocked by 
yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, by restrictions in the States. So they can't actually develop them. So yeah. it made sense that they would pivot to Canada with their project there. And this, this acquisition kind of makes sense in the fact that they could really ramp up their contracts. And then if they can bring Fission online, I think it was like what, what I had the numbers in, I was just looking at the spreadsheet before, what I had the numbers in was that it was, they'd be starting um, producing around, was it 20, 29? And it was about nine, 9 million pounds. Yeah. So, um, yeah, before they, they sort of, their production has to ramp down, they'll, um, this mine would be coming on even if you push it back a year. Um, and, yeah, they kind of hopefully get a higher multiple being um, in Canada developed, um, develop their project there as well. So, yeah, definitely see where it's coming from. And they, they timed it quite well. Obviously, Paladins, um, it's a pure stock deal. And Paladins had a hell of a run. Um, and Fissions has done very well. So to take them out for 30% premium, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't hate it. Obviously, the market didn't like it very much and pu- punished Paladin. They like, they like the fishing. They like uh, the market like fishing, but yeah, Paladin got whacked yesterday. I don't know what's yeah, today, yeah. What has it done today? Uh, yeah, whacked another three percent. No, yeah, you're kidding. Um, yeah, but then again, like I'm, I'm looking below, and it's got like yeah. lots of deep yellow and brown, and they're all. They're all getting whacked. Oh, yeah. Five, 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 six. It's just, that's pretty broad based smashing. Like, even all the coals getting smacked. What, yeah. This is like a Peabody down another 2%. Yeah. Rig down another two. Even oh. Tidewater down three. It's, yeah. <laughs> Brutal. Even, even, even physicals down three and a half. Uh, yeah. What, so, yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. What's going on? Is it? Anything to do with bloody, it runs out of the office and they want, oh, just before the tax year in Australia. I don't know. <laughs> as, 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 as Brad's often said, he's like, I, I could make you up a narrative that would sound smart, but <laughs> the, the market's opaque, uh, opaque. You're not really going to know. As I said, like, there's lots of games played in spot. Um, what is- August, when Kaz Adam Prom report earnings, everyone's thinking they're going to be pretty dismal and maybe another leg up or catalyst to reboot uranium a bit? Well, I'm pretty much already called that they're going to miss. Um, and I think the market's kind of, I don't know if the market will be that surprised by it. Like they, um, they, they, they've been pretty clear that um, unless they can get the sulfuric acid, they're, yeah. they're screwed and they can't get it. And they, even the plant's been pushed back a year for them to rectify the situation. So, um yeah, I don't think there's going to be. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any upside surprises. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. When when you actually, because that that is really the argument for the deal that I like. If you go out a bit further, is when when you run through all the numbers of everyone that's supposed to bring on, um, like a pound, there's like what because out of problems wiped out. It's pretty much the entire. Um, development space additions over the next two years. So if you take every um, uranium project and what they've just promised, like obviously you almost probably have to cut that in half because promises are, are their guidance is just bullshit. And it's like, um, and then you, you, you actually literally go in there and wipe out the guys that are obviously not going to like the, um, like take GoVX off there with Nigeria to um, push, um, push global back as far as you want um, and then just go through the ones that are just going to be obvious or already have missed with what they were predicting. And, yeah, you could probably make a case that um, is that a problem is going to wipe out more than two years of all the stuff that was supposed to come on before, yeah, you start really questioning the viability of some of the stuff that needs to be brought on, like what's even what's just happened in Nigeria with um, – Supposedly, them not um, cancelling was it Arano's what they were trying to restart there. Um, that that just recently happened next year day uh, in the last week, I think. It's um, it's kind of there's a really good argument for just wanting to build a larger uranium company that's gonna 
be big enough to um, attract kind of institutional capital because a lot of these guys are just too small to take any inflows because okay. Adaprom's kind of like you can't actually, I don't know if being an institution you could throw big money into that with all the sort of the kind of Russia, China risk. And so to be to position yourself to be large enough to accept the inflows because at the moment all they can really do is buy kind of Cameco or the ETFs or um, obviously the physical, but to to get it big enough that it can have the liquidity to take inflows could really be position it for some pretty pretty decent outperformance as well. So I kind of like it from that angle as well. Yep. I think, yeah, so of third biggest uranium company in the world now, Muck Cat, right? So, mm. yeah, good. Good to get your take on that, mate. I was um, mm. saw, that, saw that come out. I was like, one of the first questions I want to ask you this chat. Um, gee, should I be selling any uranium at the moment, mate, just before ta- end of the tax year? <laughs> just yeah, well, you, you, you could in your scenario if you're going to, yeah, mm. if you've got to realise gains. and um. Yeah, shift yourself overseas. So it probably isn't a bad time. Um, yeah, to to realise some of it that you can put back to work. Um, yeah, I'm, I haven't really sold any. I, I took a I took a slice off boss, and that's about. And I'm just like weathering the volatility from there. I hate selling in the whole. I think mm. um, the whole things, the whole space is just taking an absolute hammering. So generally, my my strategy, as I've talked about before, is when I think it's just broad base like this, I just um, go and walk my dog and my toddler. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't try and over manage it. I know this is just volatility. Um, know all my positions have a good margin of safety, well enough, and I um, just keep hunting for where value is because because there is like some of the stuff I'm buying at the moment is it's literally breaking out. It doesn't care about what the broad market's doing. It's um. It's, it's doing good things regardless of like the rest of the space taking a hammering, which I find really interesting. Maybe that's um, where I'll allocate some of my capital then to some of those um, Singapore listed companies that I saw you write about recently. If I um, decide to realize some gains before the end of the tax year over here, uh, yeah, maybe it's time to yeah take on this, a few of those positions. Yeah, I love I love those little guys. Like they they're just um yeah, like they've just had an an awful decade. Um a lot of them are pretty pretty cashed up, so you're not taking on a lot of risk and just leverage to things turning around. Like they're um and, and some of them are doing already great numbers. Yeah, like they're um they're really running like the the likes of um what was it like Mermaid Maritime? Like it's just um just like I always little OSV play and it's just um after having like a, a rough decade it's um finally seen rates rise and starting to get some love it's, it's it's almost like a um like a junior to like the um kind of like the same story hopes playing out with like uranium where you got like the chemico which would be like the tide water runs first and then like the the more leverage that goes kind of like play play a game to catch up later yeah. um as people like Realize there isn't as much talk in the the um like the big names um and so it can go out the risk curve a bit more. It's kind of like how markets work is um and and obviously the cash flows warrant it. Does that money does big money find its way in into those sectors? Obviously you think yes, but um I'm just thinking like obviously it's still quite dirty drilling offshore and like compared to uranium we had a whole narrative change with esg and a whole lot of catalysts that flowed that initial money into it do you think yeah some something similar happens how does the money find its way into offshore in a similar sort of fashion yeah i think it does 100 percent. it'll take a while at the moment everyone's still um doing the wrong thing like chasing mag seven and buying bonds i think you haven't seen that real big pivot yet. I feel like everything's kind of been held together at the moment. Um, and when, yeah, when things really start rotating again, it's probably when inflation really starts to get out of hand. Um, not smart enough to know where that, when that is. But um, yeah, it's, I'll show you like a, 
There's an article that kind of answers, I hope I still have it up. I found this really interesting. The, um, I, I didn't think I would see this yet. So this, just like one of those contrary signs that pick up on. So I was just reading this before, this is like the Australian Financial Review. And it's the idea that um, there will be kind of like a, a performance chase when the outperformance when the outperformance just can't be ignored, and this is like a this is like an Australian super fund that's um, started buying like Whitehaven, and they obviously like they're supposedly banned from doing it. Like they've they've got all their um, well not banned they've just they've got all their their kind of ESG credentials. Yeah, sells itself as an ethical and green brand, um, but yeah, now they they're buying Whitehaven, and I I just think we. We start to see more and more of this. Like, I can't always put um, uranium at the front of the front of the queue. Like, uranium, um, they'll be all over this as the the kind of renewables companies continue to underperform. So they can. Um, it's like, essentially what I'm getting at is it'll be one big performance chase. Yeah. And I was interested to see this even with coal. I I would have said this wouldn't happen for another few years. That's nuts. Like, obviously, Australian super funds are the fucking biggest uh, investors in the ASX, or they hold the most shares. So, to see them mm. dipping back into coal, or, yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, <laughs> great yeah, yeah. yeah I, I didn't, I, I didn't think that would happen for a long time because that that is part of my kind of thesis as well that I try and keep track on is like coal. You're not going to get any like multiple expansion. These things are going to just keep grinding along. That sort of two, three times cash flow, and um, we'll never get much institutional money. But that's why I try and keep a finger on the pul- pulse of like, is like the whole Australian super just going to pivot back into like coal? <laughs> well, let's hope they get into, they yeah, get into Paladin and some and Boss and some of those big names because obviously Dutton's proposed like seven, the opposition in Australia, opposition leaders proposed seven nuclear power plants to get built out in Australia. So... Um, hopefully, the whole yeah. shifts and you get, I don't know, that sort of yeah, well, the, the, There's is some quite quite interesting kickers within like what we just talked about, both Paladin and Whitehaven. Like, what, Whitehaven's interesting in that you've got a serious um, kicker in that a lot of the, the funds actually have mandates that allow them to buy MET uh, as long as the thermal percentage of the company is below a quarter, I think. And so they can actually start to pile into Whitehaven as a Met coal company, which is, um, that could be quite significant buying um, moving forward. Like if they get that like workaround and then Paladin, you got the kicker is if those, um, the, they can start developing the, the Australian um, assets they've got. If the, um, if they change the the restrictions on mining um, mining uranium, yeah, Western Australia's and and in the neck for that, yeah, yeah, but yeah, maybe we see pivot because they're, they're pretty good assets they've got. So um, yeah, but not holding my breath on that. I think we see probably more more stupidity out of Australian energy policy before we see. Um, it's kind of like a, I was, I don't know if anyone's followed like what happened with the submarines in Australia. That was quite funny. It's like they um, <laughs> were trying to trying to avoid um, nuclear powered submarines for like years and like wasted all this money like doing diesel power only to arrive at the obvious conclusion that diesel powered submarines are fucking useless and you'll you <laughs> yes, yeah you'll just get have a few diesel yeah. diesel cargoes trying, trying to make an influence in the Pacific yeah yeah acting to surface like yeah way more and just getting yeah. Chopped up, so then after all this, yeah, all this money wasted, then they just pivoted back to to nuclear submarines, which was obviously what they had to do. It's kind of like the um, forget whose quote it was. It was like you can always trust the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. It's um, it's it's the case with um, yes, yeah, this it's it's kind of like the base case with climbing the energy ladder, as you see it in military. Um, military like uh, naval vessels like they like 
it, it, they always had to adopt the the highest um, energy density to stay at the the front of like military technology. They had to go from like it was I was originally ores to sails to um, yeah. to coal um, to um, bunker to um, nuclear. I, it, it just makes zero sense if you went back to like wind. If you're a, a like a, a navy ship, and when, and when yeah, when, yeah, and when you put it like that, kind of like yeah, I think this whole what the world's going through is just one big deviation from yeah. Oh mate, I tell you what, needs. nothing is more embarrassing in Australia right now than listening to the premiers of each state because they're also they're all Labor Party quite left leaning. They all seem to pull out the safety card with nuclear, saying it's like to like obviously turn people off it. But it's just so embarrassing to see these people in press conferences pull out the bloody nuclear safety card, saying it's unsafe, saying it's like you know a danger to society, and no one wants it in their backyard. It's like fucking hell. These people just they don't understand how the world works at all. It's just, and the trouble is, the public will buy into that. I can I can guarantee yeah. a lot of the public, especially the younger people, they just they love sort of that that whole narrative of jumping on anything left, and yeah, it's quite concerning. <laughs> yeah, well, it's just going to be it's going to be expensive, and uh, it'll probably follow the what's happened in Germany. I guess they'll uh, they'll keep promising that it'll work, and it'll um, it'll get to a point at which it's really screwed up the the grid, and then there'll be a pivot then. Probably, probably would be my base case. Um, oh, sure. Unfortunate, and they'll, they'll waste an ungodly amount trying to do storage. They'll keep um, all the estimates will keep being overrun with um, what's the big hydro project at the moment? It's Snow, Snow it's River, it's two point three point. I don't know. If it's it's how, how far over budget is it? Billions of yeah. Dollars. And yeah, well, that, that's the thing. They always they always point at nuclear. Like yeah, well, there were some ridiculous <laughs> figures came out the other day for how much nuclear will cost. I swear half of it is I've, – I've got a chart somewhere where um, – I'll, I'll see if I can find it because it always cracks me up that they – like you, you almost see it when someone's constructing like a bearish uranium case. They just use um, – they just use Vogel um, for like – it's like cost and delivery. Uh, is this it? Yeah. That's a, let me bring this up. Yeah, so it's well, when when you use like um like cost cost and time to bring on like you, you always know when there's like a something's being presented and they 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 just decide to run off um Bogle in the in the United States with their their one their one reactor that took the um yeah mean construction time whereas you could use um, you could use the um, United Emirates. You could use the world average. Um, obviously, China's. If you use China's numbers, they're just crazy. That um, yeah, just knocking them out um, six six years on average, and and they're all coming online, um, sort of on cost. Or you could use yeah, t- take your pick. You could you you could even use South Korea. That's that's obviously um, yeah. But no, there's obviously a massive gap between um, if you're trying to make a point, then you just use the US bill time and cost, yeah, and you, you blow you blow you blow the numbers out of the water. Australia's yeah. probably so close to to China, South Korea, all that, all the all the equipment. It's just I don't know. I think it can be it could could be fast tracked if you if if they really wanted to just hammer it out. But yeah, who knows how it's going to yeah, go. But- Things need to get worse energy wise, and people will yep. um, vote against it. You've seen that in Europe now, yeah. It's yep. where, when you when you get to the base of it, it's um really is sort of a it's not something that can survive. Like wind and solar isn't something that can survive democracy because it, it is kind of like a luxury choice. And as soon as um it sort of starts to um the costs get too high. People will vote against it, and they'll pivot back to um, like cheap, abundant energy. They, it's um, I think we'll just see that time and time again. 
it's not something that will continue to be forced through and unless they can go a more authoritarian route, which hopefully they can't. Just like, to me, it's just super simple. You've been talking about it for years, but like almost the most important term for anything energy is, is capacity factor and how much actually these things run. And pe- people don't understand that concept, but they seem to have really strong feelings towards like a particular energy source. I've found that just in basic conversation with like a random group I might meet up with in Buenos Aires or back in when I was in Bali or in Australia, you'd, you'd talk to them and you'd just be like, like they just have no idea on what it actually means. And it's like yeah. the deciding thing between each power source, like how baseload works. And and yeah, if something's running 30% of the time, like, like it might have an installed capacity of this, but it's running 30% of the time. It's not running 90, 85% like a, a nuclear plant. And it's like, yeah, pe- people just, I find that that's just one term that can basically destroy any argument from renewables. Well, it just doesn't get called out enough. Like it's, um, it's, it's still, it like pops up the whole time and, um, and, Everyone's sort of arguing for renewable capacity. Like I, I think in one Ferg's finds, I like dug into a um, a article that was saying like half of China's capacity is now renewable, um, and like, there's a big, big difference between ca- capacity and generation. Um, and I, I was just trying to pull up a chart that shows it quite well. It's um, it's. The idea that um, China's got 20% capacity for solar, but the actual generation from solar is currently 2 or 3%. It's, um, yeah, so like if you, if you just talk capacity, kind of misleading um, yeah. people by so much. So that, yes, I, I have. Yeah, yeah here, here, here's the actual one. Um, I found this. So this is it's not the chart that I was looking for, but I don't know where the chart that I'm looking for is. Um, yeah yeah so this is the chart this is just generation so i can't show capacity but it's um it's the idea across because you understand how small it is so from 2015 solar represented zero percent of the grid in terms of generation and as of today it's um three percent whereas I believe if you show it as capacity you're um you're over 20 percent so you can you can really mark it up by showing capacity versus actual generation. But what's interesting is um, is coal, like this whole thing's growing at a hell of a rate. Like you see the, you, you were starting a total generation, um, billion kilowatt hours was the uh, total amount was um, 4,600. And now you're at seven thousand three hundred, which which is the other thing people don't understand is just how how much their energy growth um, is each year, and then how much you've actually got to grow all sources. And so what I what I was obviously illustrating with this chart is just the um, the coal growth off a really big base actually matters a lot more. Like when you're putting in six, seven, twelve percent growth off something that's already seventy five percent of your um, your generation. That yeah. matters a lot more than what gets the headlines. Is like um, you can see here some of the years, yeah. Um, like solar's putting in like a sixty-two percent growth rate. Well, that doesn't really matter that much if it's like one percent versus six um, percent on seventy-three percent matters a lot more. And it's just this all this stuff just gets lost on that just, most people. You just yeah. don't hear about that. Like you just you, get, you hear about um, installed capacity. And yeah, whatever's been added compared to yeah, what was there previously? That's yeah, it's just lost. Like you said, you don't you don't hear it. And like this is this is how the every everyday Australian this is that's the sort of news they consume constantly. It's just like it, it, it's that sort of stuff. It's there's mm-hmm. not enough contrarian or there's not enough hard facts in in a lot of this stuff. So yeah, it's. Great, you you're around for you to, to find it, mate, and point it out to me oh, and all your subs. I, I don't. I just think it's an opportunity. Like you can get angry about it. Like I've some people often ask me, like, why don't you do more? Like, try and put more out there or do 
like try and change it. I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. I just got <laughs> my little boy. So like all, 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 all I'm, yeah, all I'm going to do is try and um, make money off it and then hopefully help some other people make money off it. That's about as much change as I'm going to provide in the world. I just kind of view it as if they're doing really dumb stuff, then it makes it easy for us to take the other side. Kind of like the idea coal's going away. You just need to run through those sort of figures and you understand they're actually going to need a lot more of it. And and you just got to read what they're actually doing. So much of it just doesn't get really like they've only really started. Um, Bloomberg started running like the stories on how much India's grown its coal um, more recently. A lot of that just didn't make it to the headlines for the better part of a year that they were um, expanding their coal by more than a quarter, and they're just absolutely ramping the shit out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. No, I like the idea of taking the other side of of that sort of stuff. And yeah, like I get angry about it. <laughs> mm. But um, I think that was half, half the trouble with that was from working at the last company I worked at, which was just probably the wokest company in Australia at the time. Um, next level, how much you dig into this stuff. It's, yeah, I like it. I think about mm. myself trying to do the, the level of work. And I'm like, no, I don't have it in me. <laughs> I'm, I don't think I, I'm yeah. like crazy and I'm far too distracted by, I don't know, lots of other stuff that I shouldn't be distracted uh, by. Like, yeah, it's funny you say that because then I read someone else's work and I'm like, they're so much more like detailed than me. Like I, I'm leaving lots of stones unturned. There's this problem with this game and like <laughs> feel like I feel way more pressure now when you know people like following you into stuff and then you, um, yeah. If I miss something really obvious, like I, I do it quite regularly. Like I, I've had it with a few positions. Someone's like, oh, did you notice there's like this massive warrant, um, m- m- mount warrants outstanding? They're like, no, completely missed that. Just going to be honest. Yeah, it's just like, no, <laughs> fucking missed that. Yeah. No, I like missed, yeah, m- missed this recent news release on it. Yeah. yeah. What, um, what are you working on at the moment on your sub stack? Like what's the next article that we're likely to see? Um, I have one on um, a one for pro that's um, just diving into multiples and like also a few interesting companies I'm trying to wrap my head around. One's one's like a weird company in Hong Kong that's got more cash than market cap. It's bought a coal company and I'm just trying to understand it better. One's um, another one's just another little offshore player um and the one that i'm riding at the moment as well for the main sub stack is um just getting into the physical metal space and how i'm gonna apportion the physical metals i'm gonna buy how i'm actually practically doing it and what i've learned um this is quite a tricky space as well I, i thought it was far more simple than it actually is like you end up getting stung in lots of ways like if you're you have to pay up a premium to you not know, to actually buy the metal. The storage isn't that bad. The storage you can usually dial down to like half a percent a year. It's more annoying actually paying the premium. Like silver, for example, you end up paying like 8 to 10% premium just to buy, which is pretty significant oh. amount if you then got to ship it to the facility as well and they charge another, another few percent on top of that. So you're looking at like friction of actually getting the stuff in the vault of like between 10 and 15%, which if you're talking a lot of money, you can be, yeah, trying to work out if that's competitive. And then you need to work out the back end as well as like, um, are they going to clip you too much if you sell with them? And yeah, there's a this whole learning curve. And then there's also the premium really fluctuates on, on demands as well. Oh, right. So... If, if something's in real demand, you can see the premium blow out to like um, like platinum, for example. I've seen it range from 6% to like 20%. Yeah. Jesus. You think in storage, Australia, Singapore, Switzerland? Uh, Singapore and Switzerland. Yeah. yeah. No, definitely not. Definitely not Australia. Definitely not. So some countries are also paying with um, having to pay VAT on um, – on yeah, some of the medals. Which mate. Oh. Yeah. That'll um 
forward to reading that. For anyone who doesn't know, Trader Ferg's Substack, um, fantastic. Make sure you subscribe to it. Uh, he send out, sends out a weekly free uh, newsletter, uh, Ferg's Finds. So, yeah, make sure you subscribe to that and check it out. Uh, thanks for joining us again, mate, for number eight. And, yeah. yeah. Cheers, man. It's awesome. Great chatting. Sweet. Yeah.